In this video, Jordan Peterson talks about how the distribution of wealth can be unequal in a society. The system in Russia, the Soviet Union, which was a collection of states, an empire, <clears throat> and the system that Mao established in China, and the system that still exists in Korea as a remnant of the Cold War, and systems in Southeast Asia and in Africa, were all predicated on Marxist presuppositions um, presuppositions that were utopian in nature and that posited a, a utopian future where property was held in common and everyone had enough and everyone was called upon to do what they could right, from each according to his ability to each according to his need which is a lovely sentiment and you can imagine how it would be attractive, even intellectually, because of course, other systems, all other systems, produce vast disparities in income. Uh, it's like a natural law. Uh, it's actually governed by. You can ma model it with a distribution called the Pareto distribution, and the Pareto distribution looks like this. It doesn't look like a normal distribution. A lot of you guys have been told about no normal distributions and how many things follow on normal distribution, most things, but that's really a limited case. You can understand a Pareto distribution if you, you've all played Monopoly, I presume. At the beginning, everyone has the same amount of money, will include property, the same amount of wealth. And then what happens as the game progresses, and really as a function of chance, I mean, I know you have to use your head a little bit in Monopoly, but the basic rule is just buy everything you can get your hands on, and then trade meanly, something like that. So, at the beginning everybody has the same amount, and then as you begin to play, if you had enough players, you would develop an, a normal distribution, because some people would win relatively consistently, and some people would lose relatively consistently, and so the money starts to be distributed in a normal distribution, but the thing about money, and the thing about lots of things, is that zero is involved, and zero is a, a weird place, because if you're playing a trading game, and you hit zero, then you're done, and so, and it's very hard to recover from zero, and you know, it's really hard to recover, you know when you're doomed in Monopoly you know, you, you can tell, you've got some resources but there's going to be some crisis when you land on some hotel and you're going to get wiped out, you know it, so there's a point at which you're headed for zero even if you have something you know, and you might be rescued by luck but you know when you're doomed so what happens is that as you continue to play Monopoly, more and more people stack up as zero, and fewer and fewer people have more and more money. And when the game is over, everyone has nothing except one person, and they have all of it. Now, the funny thing about that is that, in some sense, that's how trading games work, you know? You, got, you might wonder why, is there, why there is inequality in a society. And it's easy to consider that it's because the society is corrupt, and perhaps, you know, societies are somewhat or horribly corrupt. That's the variation. There's no society that's without its criminal and criminal element and fixed element. Anyways, trading games tend to produce a Pareto distribution so that very many people have very little, and a tiny minority have a tremendous amount. That's the 1% that you hear about, right? And, you know, the thing about that 1% is that that's happened in every society that's ever been studied. It doesn't really matter what the governmental system is, and it certainly, handled, it certainly happened under the Soviets, that's for sure. And there was a lot of people who had enough zero, so they just died. So, you know, the, the, the utopian dream was completely unimplementable for a variety of very complex reasons. One is that it's very hard to fight against that distribution pattern when people are trading, because mere statistics will do that. And then there's other things that, and I should tell you as well that the Pareto distribution governs, governs a lot of things. So, 
Like if you look at books, if I remember properly, last year there was something like a million English language books published and I think 500 of them sold more than 100,000 copies which is none, right? That's none and of that 500 you can be sure that one of them was by Stephen King and he took half the money because there's like five authors in the English language who are at, on every airport paperback stand occupying the top rung and that's massive real estate, right? because it's replicated everywhere and because they're so prominent and because there are known names when people are in a hurry and they just want something to read they just grab that and then more money goes to those people and so, you know, success breeds success and failure breeds failure and it's not necessarily linear and that's a really difficult thing to deal with and it's hard on societies because one of the things we do know is that you know, as you stretch out the inequality you make men, particularly, on the lower end of the distribution more and more likely to be aggressive it's sort of like, you imagine every man has a threshold for violence um, and status is important to men not that it's not important to women, but it's different it's, it's a different kind of status it's, status is important to men because it's one of the things that makes them marketable as partners to women so it actually turns out to be quite important to men the men tend to compete with one another for status, hierarchy position, and in a really unequal society if you're like a low rung guy then, and you don't have any opportunity to rise because the society isn't structured so that there's mobility, then the more aggressive guys tend to turn to criminality, and you know, and so you could say there's a threshold for criminality, and the more inequality pressure you put on a particular area, geographic or political area, the more inequality pressure you put on it, the more men slip past that threshold and into criminality. And you know, there's been pretty good studies done of drug gang in Chicago. That, that was the best one. A sociologist actually went and hung out with a drug gang for he got into it. I guess the drug gang leader was, you know. I wouldn't say necessarily narcissistic, but that might be a reasonable way of thinking about it and he was kind of happy with the idea of maybe being the subject of a book and, and so this guy was able to associate with them, got to know them quite well and then the housing project in which the gang was housed was slated for demolition and the gang broke up and he got the books, because they kept books and what he found was the average street drug dealer, first of all, was employed in another job as well and was making far less than minimum wage now, but the guys, you know, further up the chain, of course followed the Pareto distribution and so there was a tiny minority of them who were raking in a tremendous amount of loot and the guys at the bottom were just waiting around for the possibility that they could rise up the hierarchy and, you know, it's a pretty violent game, so the chances that someone's going to be taken out is pretty high and then a little slot opens up for some opportunistic second raider and perhaps he can move up the hierarchy so, the Pareto distribution governs all sorts of other things too, I mentioned it governs the popularity of books, the sales of books, but it, it also it also characterizes the distribution of everything that people produce so if you think of creative production of any sort, artistic production, industrial production, it doesn't matter almost everything fails and a few things succeed beyond anyone's wildest imagination Apple's a good example of that, 